1996, Bill Gates said, content is king. And boy was he right. Three decades later, it still occupies the throne. For lawyers, law firms, and companies serving the legal industry, content marketing and thought leadership marketing are a must if they want to build their books of business or increase their revenues. Hi, I'm Wayne Pollock. I'm a former AmLaw50 senior associate who discovered the world of content marketing and thought leadership marketing and hasn't looked back. In each episode of this podcast, I interview lawyers and legal industry in-house marketers who are doing big things with their content marketing and thought leadership marketing. This is Legally Contented. Welcome to episode number six of Legally Contented. I'm your host, Wayne Pollock. If your firm was going to launch a podcast, what would be some of the outcomes the firm would be looking for? How about increasing awareness of the firm and its attorneys among the firm's target audiences? How about solidifying the firm's attorneys as thought leaders in the areas of law they practice? How about those attorneys getting invited to speak at conferences where the firm's target audiences will be, and perhaps being invited to contribute to publications read by the firm's target audiences? How about expanding the firm's referral base? How about bringing in cases? My guest for this episode, Delizy Friday, could claim to have done all of that with her firm's podcast. Delizy is the Director of Marketing and Business Development at Cowan Rodriguez Peacock. The firm is based in San Antonio, and it focuses on 18-wheeler and commercial vehicle cases involving death and catastrophic injury. She is the brains and the muscle behind the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation. In our conversation, Delizy and I discuss how Trial Lawyer Nation came to be, best practices for producing a business-to-business, lawyer-to-lawyer podcast like Trial Lawyer Nation, best practices for marketing and promoting the podcast, things that Delizy has done that have worked out well and things that haven't worked out so well. We also talk about the benefits of the podcast and what the podcast has meant for Cowan Rodriguez Peacock and for Michael Cowan in particular, who is the host of the podcast. While the majority of our conversation focuses on the Trial Lawyer Nation podcast, Delizy and I also talk about the role of referral marketing at a business-to-business law firm like Cowan Rodriguez Peacock and we talk about how the firm transformed from a direct-to-consumer type law firm to a business-to-business law firm that focuses on getting referrals from other lawyers to bring in its cases. I know, Cowan Rodriguez Peacock is a catastrophic personal injury law firm, but everything that Delizy and I discuss in our conversation can be applied to any law firm, especially corporate defense firms and boutique law firms. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Delizy. Delizy Friday, welcome to Legally Contented. Thanks for joining me. Please introduce yourself and tell us all how you got to be where you are today. Hi, I am Delizy Friday. I am the Director of Marketing and Business Development for Cowan Rodriguez Peacock and the award-winning legal podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation. Yes, the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation, which is why you so graciously accepted my invitation. I I wanted to talk to you about the podcast because I am fascinated by the fact that what I would consider to be a boutique plaintiff's firm in Texas has created, with the help of obviously you and your genius, has created an award-winning podcast that hasn't just elevated the firm, it has also, I'm sure, brought in cases and probably accomplished some more other thought leadership things that you had hoped, uh, maybe some that beyond that were your wildest dreams. I'm hopeful you could talk to us a little bit about the background of the podcast, how you launched it, the strategy behind it. But before we go there, tell us a little bit about Cowan Rodriguez Peacock. Tell us about the firm, uh, how many attorneys you have, the key practice areas, all that good stuff. Sure. So Kellen Rodriguez Peacock is a trucking and commercial vehicle law firm. We are located in Texas, but we handle cases across the country. We have 10 lawyers and 35 employees here in the office, but it wasn't always like that. When I first started, there were three lawyers, no, four lawyers, and we did not have that many employees, but it's grown and expanded since then, and it continues to do so. What has been the cause of that growth? 
Well, I mean, I don't want to toot my own horn. (laughs) I would say there are a variety of factors that have caused that growth. And I think some of that is learning what marketing works and what marketing does not. And I'm happy to talk about what that road looked like for us because Next week, I will celebrate seven years at this firm. And I can tell you when I started, the things we were doing to market our firm for the first two years are vastly different from what we're doing now because we had to learn what was going to work for us and what wasn't. And once we got into our groove and started to see what's working and then put more money towards those efforts, we started to see the results. And one of those certainly is our podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation. That was something that was just an idea. And then it turned into a lot more than that. And so I would say a lot of different things come into that, but not only the marketing, also the business side of it. I don't think people talk enough about the business side of running a law firm. We made decisions about the types of cases we took on, how many cases each lawyer had, and really fine-tuned that to get to where we're at today because the types of cases we accepted when I came on and how many cases each lawyer had and how many lawyers we had, that was very different from where we're at now. And it took a lot of analytics and really looking at our firm to decide what was going to work for us. There is a yin and a yang to marketing and running the business. And it's fascinating how they play off each other because if you're not attracting enough of the right cases to be choosy, then you can't be choosy. And likewise, if you're taking the wrong cases that aren't profitable for your firm, you can't grow your firm. You can't be known for the right kinds of cases you want to be known for because you don't have the money to do the promotions, to do the marketing. So it's fascinating to me, the yin and yang of the business side of the law firm and the marketing and business development side of the law firm. Let's go back before the podcast was launched because the podcast was launched January 2018. So tell me a little bit about how the marketing was done at the firm before then. And as part of that conversation, what made you decide or what made you and the team decide that a podcast might be a a feasible marketing tactic? So when I first started, we did not have the podcast. We marketed our firm all B2C. When I came on, we tried to get into the SEO game and the digital marketing game. And in all reality, unless you've got a ton of money to compete with the firms who are really knocking it out of the park and have huge marketing budgets, it's just really difficult to do. The other part of it when it comes to marketing like that is also realizing the additional money that goes into that, and that's staffing your office to handle that marketing strategy. If you're going to spend tens of thousands or hundreds and thousands of dollars to market to the public, you need to have the staff to take all of those phone calls, address all of those emails, and someone's got to go sign up those cases. And that's the hidden fee that you're not always thinking about when you market like that. So we started with that. I will tell you that it wasn't as successful. We were not getting the kinds of cases that we wanted. So I sat down with Michael, the firm owner, and we really looked at our cases and said, what are the cases that bring us the most money and how did we get them? And I think to anyone listening, you really do have to sit down and look at your cases every year at the very least, if not more than that, to figure out what are the cases that are coming in, where did they come from, and how do we get more cases like that? I know a lot of people run their numbers and they say, okay, let's look at our average fee, but I encourage people to look at your median fee too, because you might have one client with billable hours that offsets all the others and that skews your numbers. So I really encourage people to look at numbers a variety of different ways. And that's what we had to do. We had to look at where our cases were coming from and which ones brought the most money. And in doing so, we realized the cases where we made the most money were cases referred to us by another law firm. Mm -hmm. So we made the decision at that point to focus our energy on marketing to other lawyers 
and trying to get more cases referred to us by another law firm. And when we did that, we realized the cases that we were taking on were much better quality. And we also didn't need to have as strong of an intake department and as much overhead because if a lawyer is referring you another case, you don't have to worry about making sure that client is closed and signed up right then and there before they go to your competitor. And so we were able to be a little leaner in our staff as well. And that's how the process started. Once we did that, we realized let's transition from marketing B2C and market B2B. And then after we did that, Joe Freed, who anyone in the personal injury world knows is just a very well-known, respected trucking lawyer, and Michael Leeserman, who is another respected lawyer, sat with Michael and said, you should really think about now fine-tuning the types of cases that you accept. There is a phrase in marketing, niches get riches. So the thought process is if you specialize and you focus in this one area, people are always going to think of you as a lawyer for that one area. And when we decided to do that, it came true for us that we are the lawyers that people call when they have a trucking or commercial vehicle case. And it was scary. It was definitely scary in in total honesty. When you decide to do that and not accept other cases, you get a little bit scared thinking, oh, man, how am I going to make it up? But for us, we made the decision. It took some time and it, it worked really well for us. And that's how that transition happened and the business thought process behind it. Referral marketing still today is one of the most underrated strategies and I guess tactics that law firms can engage in. And regardless of whether you're a plaintiff's firm, you are a, a personal injury firm, you're a family law firm, you're a large corporate law firm, so often we as lawyers and as marketers get seduced by the shiny objects or the marketing channels that other companies might use, Facebook ads, Google pay-per-click, all that stuff. And for some firms or for many firms, they work. But to your point, it requires a lot of money, both in the actual ad spend as well as the strategy and the planning. And yet most firms still, even with solid PPC Uh, uh, campaigns, solid Facebook campaigns, they still take referral sources, take referrals. And oftentimes those are those cases that are referred are their best cases. So Mm -hmm. they just don't do what you and Michael did, which is to say, okay, well, maybe we should think seriously about pivoting. And I'm sure the reason why they don't have those conversations is to your point, it's scary as hell, because you are leaving the comfort of the, the flow of cases, regardless of how profitable they are, they're comfortable because you know they're coming in, you know how to hopefully handle them, and you know what they're going to yield in terms of fees for your firm. So you went on a limb and decided with Michael and others to pivot. Before we get to the podcast, what were some of the marketing strategies that you began to employ once you made the pivot to more of a referral marketing B2B type outreach? So what we did is we identified the lawyers who had already referred us cases to let them know we're going to do this more. Tell us, you know, in in my mind, those are low hanging fruit. That's easy for me to grab and say, okay, I can expand that business. A lot of B2B is creating and maintaining relationships. So we started by reaching out to all those law firms who had brought us in on cases in the past and said, hey, do you have anything else? That was an easy win for us early on. So when we stopped taking on those small crashes, we could get some cases from people we'd already established a relationship with. Then we said, okay, who are our targets? Who are the people that we think are going to be able to refer us cases and how do we reach out to them? I am a huge fan of direct mail. Everyone is emailing and you can be inundated with emails all day long, but how do you stand out an email? So we came up with some direct marketing plans and wrote a letter and different marketing pieces, letting people know, hey, we're here to partner with you. If you have a case like this, refer it to us. It's not expensive. You don't even have to send it out in this beautiful cardstock and this beautiful envelope. It's just something simple um, saying, hey, here's what we're doing. Send us a case. We started out like that. And then we started hosting annual CLEs. And our annual CLE was one of the marketing strategies we did 
to help elevate us as a thought leader in the space that we wanted more cases from. I will tell you that took some time. It doesn't happen overnight, but it was one of a variety of ways where we said we need to get the word out. These are the kinds of cases that we're accepting and let's offer a free CLE to people and talk about these kinds of cases so they can see we really do know what we're talking about. We believe we have an abundance mentality. If you share information with others, it comes back to you. So that was another part of just living our motto and our beliefs. And that was another way that we did it. But we started small and, and we started by reaching out to those who we already had the relationships with and then came up with a plan on how do we get more relationships. I love the CLE angle and I, I beg my clients to do the CLEs because it is such a great way, A, to really market yourself in terms of knowledge and the wisdom that you have, but also more importantly, to remind them of what you're knowledgeable about and what you're wise about, i.e. the kinds of cases you want them to send to you. So mm-hmm. you can have a general kind of part of the presentation where you're talking about best practices for trials or, or whatever, but then you can also shift to a more in the weeds kind of discussion about your area of the law, because not only do you want to show that you're knowledgeable, but you also kind of want to dissuade them from doing these cases themselves. So you walk through the the difficulties of bringing these cases, dealing with the experts or the medical records, and suddenly you're, you're painting a picture of, well, not only are these guys and girls really knowledgeable about the area of law they practice, this sounds like a terrible thing for me to have to do myself. I'll just refer them, get a referral fee down the road, and and everybody's happy. So I think the CLEs right. are, are, are a great way to, to build that rapport. And when you do it in person, and you can invite them to your office if you have a big enough conference room, or you do it at a hotel, ballroom, whatever it is, but you have some face-to-face, right? You are, you are leading the CLE, and then during a break, the attorneys are walking around mingling. That builds rapport, that builds much more of a relationship than simply a Zoom CLE. And I don't know where what it is for Texas, but in Pennsylvania, for a law firm to be able to be approved by the Pennsylvania CLE board, it's a whopping $25. It's a two-page application. And then if you want to pay for your attendees' CLE credits, it's a whopping $1.50 an hour. It is so ridiculously cheap and easy to do. And yet, again, just like the general referral marketing big picture stuff. The CLEs are not something you see a lot of law firms do. It is a huge space. Again, no matter if you're a plaintiff's firm or a corporate defense firm, a huge opportunity for those firms that are smart enough to see the value that they can create and the referral relationships they can build through such a program. Oh, absolutely. Those conversations on a break or afterwards are where you create those relationships. Um, and inadvertently, you're going to get a case out of it because you're brainstorming about a case. Hey, I have this one case. You mentioned this. What do you think about this? And then when you start to talk about it more, that's when you create that relationship where a, a referral will do well for both parties. And you're right. This doesn't have to be just something that plaintiff firms do. Defense attorneys can do that all the time. I would encourage them to think, okay, well, what can we talk about? What changes have happened? And we want to notify our clients about, and it can work both ways, but we've absolutely loved it. And just to take it one step further, I would encourage anyone who does this to hire a videographer, just use, if you have a video camera in your office, set it up in the back and record it, and then hire a graphic designer to create small clips of the CLE that you're putting on and share those on your social media so you can further use all of the great topics that you are talking about and remind people you're a thought leader in this space. If you're going to do this once, how can you maximize the use of your time and use it a variety of different ways? When it comes to marketing, that's what you should be thinking about all the time. If I'm going to do this once, how can I use it three, four, five, ten different ways? Yeah, you hear lawyers talk about the cliche number of bites at the apple when they're talking about, you know, motions to dismiss or amended complaints. Well, guess what? We talk about bites of the apple when we're talking about repurposing content. You, you've done it, right? You've built the content, created the content, repurpose it in a number of ways, distribute it in all its different forms, and you can get as much bang for your buck as possible. Okay, so the firm makes this pivotal decision that it's going to pivot to more of a business to business marketing approach, a referral marketing approach. We're going to niche down into trucking cases. Where does Trial Lawyer Nation start to enter the the mind here? So, the true story 
Michael was on a run and he wanted to listen to a podcast where he could learn more about the legal industry and feel like he was learning as he was running. And he couldn't find a legal podcast for what he wanted. So he came back and he said to Lisi, we're going to create a legal podcast. And I laughed. And then he was like, no, I'm being serious. (laughs) So, So... I am the person where if you say we're going to do something, even if I've never done it before, we're going to find out how we do it and then we're going to do it. And that's exactly what happened. He said, okay, find out how to do a podcast and we're going to do it ourselves because if there's not one out there, I can't be the only lawyer who's thinking, why can't I find a podcast that helps me better my trial skills and talk more about running a law firm because everyone needs to hear that. They don't teach that to you in law school and they really should. And we'll just do it ourselves. And so we did. And that is how the Trial Lawyer Nation podcast started and continues. We're now in our fifth year to just rock. Okay. Well, you're being modest because the idea came about Michael conveyed the idea to you, and then you had to go and run with it. So walk us through, and by the way, before we get started there, it's a funny reminder that there are sometimes things that just don't exist because no one thought to put them together and you shouldn't assume that someone's doing it somewhere already. We're only talking late 2017, early 2018 in terms of your podcast launching. It's not like we're in the beginning of the podcast era. You had probably a decade plus of the podcast era, and yet still at that time, no one had created the kind of podcast that Michael was looking for and that you ended up creating. So it's just a great reminder that, especially when it comes to content and marketing, that sometimes people haven't created things because they just haven't created things. And your idea after a little bit of Googling and a little bit of asking around, your idea could have legs. You have to test it first, but at least know that not every great idea has been created already, or not every podcast topic has been created, or not every blog has been created that covers all the topics. And perhaps you have something to add to the marketplace of ideas that hasn't been explored properly, like the way you would want to do it. So talk great. to us a little bit about the podcast. He has this great idea and you go, great, let's do it. And then what? So how to start a podcast 101. First, (laughs) this was before 2020. I had to think to myself, how do I record podcasts? Again, Google and Amazon were my best friend. So I just went online and bought recording devices for us to record the, the audio. Then I talked with Michael about what is the goal of the podcast? What do we want to talk about? We have to have a theme. We have to have a purpose before we just do this. And funny enough, what we thought the podcast was going to be and what it turned into and what it is today are very different. In our minds, we thought when we created the podcast, let's do a podcast where the only people we interview are people who had awesome trial results. Everyone wants to hear about someone's awesome trial result after it happens. So let's do a podcast just about that. And we realized that the conversations, not just about trial results, were really beneficial to us and to our fans as well. So we evolved in in terms of what we thought the podcast was going to be. We also decided how regularly we were going to do it. I will tell you, at first we said, let's just have a podcast air once a month. And we thought maybe that's not enough. It's, it's not enough content. Let's do it twice a month on the 1st and the 15th of every month because it'll give people enough time to listen to that first podcast. And then when we're done listening to it, we'll have another one. The other thing we had to realize is lawyers don't have unlimited time. So putting together a podcast is a time commitment And the hard part is when you're interviewing other lawyers, you're not worried about just one lawyer's calendar. Everyone's got depots and hearings and prep that they're doing that it's really hard to schedule two different lawyers on a call um, or meeting in person. So the way we started was before we launched, we recorded several podcasts and had like this bank of podcasts. And I'm so happy we did it. And I encourage anyone else who's launching a podcast to do that because what I realized is 
you can schedule recording a podcast, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen. <laughs> Sometimes someone's going to say, I got sick. Someone's going to say, I have an emergency hearing. It's not going to happen. And I will also tell you our first year of recording the podcast, there were things that happened that we couldn't plan for. One time Michael recorded a podcast without hitting the record button and I wanted to cry. One time we had audio recorded and something went wrong. There was like a malfunction in the SD card and I didn't get my audio. And so things will happen. I encourage you to just have a bank or at least one episode recorded before you need to launch your next one to try and help with that because planning for situations like that, I think is important if you wanna stay consistent and just recognize whatever you commit to means committing in advance. I know when we record our podcast, I've got to have enough time to edit the audio, write an episode description, market the podcast, You can't do it last minute because if you're going to do this, you want to do it right. And what I realized after doing this for the years that we've done it is the podcasts do better when I can market them in advance and tell people what to expect. Then they're excited to listen to it. And then when it airs, I need to continue marketing it after I've launched it so people know they should tune in. And so we've gotten better at marketing before launch when it launches and after a launch so people can tune in because what you don't want to do is launch a podcast and then no one's going to listen to it. You have to put in the effort to get people to listen to it and then let it do its thing. So that's how we started. I bought the podcast audio equipment. I made sure we had podcasts recorded before we launched. We talked about when we were going to launch it and I would regularly follow up and say, what's our plan We need to have audio recorded so we can get this done in time. And what the show turned into kind of transitioned from there because as we had conversations, we realized which conversations we benefited the most from and our fans benefited the most from because the great thing about podcasts is you can look at these stats. If you look at your stats to see which episodes have the most downloads, you can very easily tell which ones are really resonating with your fans. And that's an important part of this. You want to have content out there that people listen to. And that's that's very easy to do with podcasts. You have a number of things I want to cover. What is the analytical tool you're using to track your podcast results? There's a variety of different platforms. We use a platform called Blueberry, B-L-U-B-R-R-Y. And Blueberry will give me statistics like how many downloads happen. And downloads is the amount of people who are listening to your podcast. It'll also tell you how many people stop at a certain point. What's important for me to look at is are people stopping halfway through and they never listen again? And do they finish it? Because you have to remember, a lot of people listen to podcasts on their commute to work. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. Some people are going to listen to half of the podcast on their way to work, and then they're going to finish it a couple days later. So take that information, but just remember how people consume their podcasts. I also look at where people are in the country and in what states, so I can see the geography of where our fans are. And then it also will tell me what devices people are listening to the podcast from. I know that more than 80% of our listeners on our podcast listen from their Apple iPhones. And the smaller majority after that are listening on an Android and a very select few people listen on their desktop. And that helps me understand how people are consuming their content. I will tell you, I use that data to launch an app for our podcast. I thought that was the next step in our podcast growth to really connect more with our listeners. It didn't do well. I've stopped using it and I just consider it a lesson, if you will. But I use that data to see if that was the next step in our podcast. So there's a lot of good information you can get. You're not going to get the creepy data from your cell phones like, what zip code are these people listening to the podcast in? Because (laughs) I can get that data. No, you're not going to get that. You can get a metro area. I can tell you the top 10 cities people listen to our podcast from. But those are the different kinds of analytics that you can get from podcasts. What was the app? What, what, what did the app offer the listener? So in, in my mind, 
the Trial Lawyer Nation app was going to be a way for us to have people listen to the podcast from their cell phone, but on the app. And then I could add extra content on their um, clips, behind the scenes things to try and engage people more and use the app to send a text notification to let people know right away when a podcast dropped. In my mind, that was just another way to tell people when a new show was out and it didn't work. (laughs) <laughs> and when, not everything will that's what marketing is you can't be in marketing and expect everything to go great and be a winner you have to learn from your areas of opportunity and then find a way to make it work what about the app didn't work we didn't have very many people who subscribed to the app and Creating an app for anyone who is crazy enough to do it is not easy. App development is its own world. And trying to communicate with people who are developing apps it takes a technical skill set that a lot of common people do not have. I consider myself tech savvy, but when it comes to building an app, it ended up being like a money pit, just more money and more money and more money to fix it and get it to what we wanted. And at at some point I had to take away that sunk cost fallacy in my mind and say, just because I spent a certain amount of money doesn't mean I have to throw more at it to make it work. And I think if it worked better, maybe it would have done better. And I think if we had provided more reason for people to use it, it would have done better saying you're going to get a text notification. That's not sexy. That's not going to make me um, download an app to my phone. If I'm going to get more content, then where is it? I I wasn't sharing that. I think there are a bunch of different things that contributed to why it wasn't in my mind a success. Well, it's an important reminder too to know your audience. I take it for granted that I subscribe to podcasts that I want to listen to. I press the button, whether it's subscribe or follow, whatever it is, to get the automatic downloads. But you talking to me here reminds me that not everyone does that. And they might actually need a reminder in the form of an email blast, in the form of a notification from an app or something to be reminded of that. And that if they forget about your podcast, just like they forget about your firm, you're not going to be top of mind. And it's like you don't exist. So that's a great point is to know your audience on one hand, maybe an app isn't the best mechanism for reaching and building relationships with attorneys that are in your target audience. But at the same time, the intent is super concrete, which is we have to get these people to remember that we have a podcast. It's on the 1st and 15th, and we want them to listen to it each and every time. Right. And I will tell you, I used that to change some of my marketing up a little bit. So we decided if our intent was to let people know when we launch a podcast each time, the app's not working. So what can we do? We used to do a monthly email that said, here are your two new podcasts each month. Now we do an email, the date an episode launches. And that was just a way to kind of pivot and say, I'm still getting done what I need to get done. And that's done well. In my mind, we should have done that a while back but I'm glad we're doing it now and it makes sense. Well, and you make another great point going back to deciding even when to publish on the 1st and the 15th. I am probably on the far side of podcast consumption. I go to the gym all the time. I have a dog I walk. I have a commute to work in the form of a walking commute. So I'm listening to podcasts all the time. But some people might not be regular listeners to podcasts and they aren't going to listen if you drop a podcast every week or even every day, and then you kind of lose the benefit of that content being published frequently. So again, having the two week interval really is is impressive because it shows that you realize your audience, mostly plaintiff's attorneys are super busy. They've got a lot going on. And if you want to maximize the return on the investment in terms of time and energy of the podcast, you have to make sure that you are meeting your audience where they're at. And I talk about content audience fit a lot in terms of saying the right things that your audience wants to hear, but the delivery is part of it. You have to know their lifestyle and know that they're not going to want to listen to a three hour podcast like Joe Rogan does, but they also probably want something a little bit more meaty than a 15 minute little quick podcast. Yeah, I agree with that. And I also think to anyone who might start a podcast to think about duration, but don't feel like you have to lock down on something as well. Initially, 
we didn't have a time slot. We don't want to go over an hour or we want to make sure it's always over 30 minutes. We just went where the conversation took us. And I think when you start a podcast, you have to do that to see what is my sweet spot. And then just recognize if you're going to go longer than 30 minutes, you need to think about the fact that your audience is probably going to listen to your podcast maybe two or three different times to, to finish it because they're not going to finish it in one sitting, or maybe they do, but that's something to, to take into consideration too. There are some podcasts out there that are 15 to 20 minutes each time and that's it. And they just do smaller increments and they push out podcasts every week and they can cause they're shorter, but the duration and the consistency of your podcast, again, is going to determine, be determined by your audience and, and what's your goal. Let's talk about that your goal, your objectives. Did you and Michael sit down when you were thinking about the podcast and say, okay, after X amount of months or X amount of years, we're hoping to have A amount of cases or B amount of listeners. Did you get into the weeds about what you thought your objectives might be or your goals might be? So at the very beginning, the goal was just to succeed in putting out a podcast consistently, professionally, and using the podcast to continue to market the firm. I didn't think at the very beginning, this is a way we're going to get new business. In my mind, it was more thought leadership. Branding is my goal. We wanted to have conversations with people that we learned from, and we could share that value in the podcast. And eventually, we got more and more people listening to it. That's when we thought, okay, maybe we can actually make this something that we do a soft ask and say, hey, we're here if you want to partner on a case. But it didn't start like that because we had to create the relationship with our fans first. We needed them to listen to enough podcasts to get to know who we are and feel like they know us. When you do a podcast, it's kind of odd because you're talking. You don't know who's listening. You don't know how many people are listening. And then the people who are listening, after a while, they feel like they know you. And it creates this relationship, but it's so different and unique because you're not actually meeting the people who you're creating a relationship with. And so it, it wasn't until we were looking at our stats and realizing we had more people consistently listening to the show that we realized okay, we might have something here where we can start to tell people, hey, if you want to contact us on a case, let's do that. But how do we do it? We're not a hard sell. Hey, call us now. And it's just, it, we didn't want it to be aggressive because it didn't want people to think that was a reason and the only reason we're doing this. Our heart was still in the same place, but we also had to realize we had an opportunity here to get more business and we wanted to, to test the waters. When you were thinking about the workflow about the the podcast, you mentioned you editing it. Are you still editing it this many years later? How are you handling both the editing and the promotion of it? So in the beginning, when we started the podcast, we had a marketing agency that we used and the marketing agency had someone on their team who could edit the podcast for us. We since then split ways and now my marketing department is all in-house. So I have a graphic designer on my team and his skills were able to allow us to use him instead to edit the podcast. And it worked out better because since he's in-house, we edit the podcast ourselves, And then we also create all of the clips and all the highlight reels internally as well. And that helps us push out more content because we're in-house and we do it. For anyone who doesn't have a marketing department in-house, there are also numerous companies out there now who will do this for you. When I parted ways with my agency and I had no idea what to do, I reached out to a company called Next Day Podcast, and they edited my podcast for $75, and it sounded beautiful, and they would do it within 24 hours. And they're in England, so while I slept... I would wake up and I'd have a podcast and it was great. They're still around and I recommend them to people because not everyone has someone who can do this and it's really easy to reach out to them and they do a great job very quickly, but you don't have to do it all yourself. There are certainly different places now. I, I just heard of some company called Law Pods and all they do is help law firms create a podcast. That's their whole business now. So when I first started, we didn't have that and now law firms are recognizing the potential of creating a podcast 
to build your brand, build yourself as a thought leader, but then also get business too. Well, there's your riches in the, in the niches example of law pods, right? Like it's arguably the same skills and the same techniques, but we're going to apply it to a particular area of, of the market. And we're going to market ourselves to those people and position ourselves as leaders. And if we're not already lawyers or familiar with the legal market, we will develop that knowledge and then we'll, our marketing will reflect our expertise or our specialization. So there you go. Niches mm -hmm. and riches, even when it comes to podcast editors and podcast companies. Looking back at these past few years worth of the podcast, how did you know that the podcast started working? However you would define, however you and Michael would define working, what were some of the signs that you saw that led you to believe that yeah, this podcast thing is getting traction and really becoming something? There were a couple things. I laughed at the first one because the first time I realized our podcast was really working was when Michael came back from a seminar where he was a speaker and someone in the crowd came up to him afterward and said, oh my gosh, I am so happy to meet you. I listen to your podcast all the time. My favorite episode is this and it is so nice to meet you in person. And he came back to the office, a little pep in his step. And he said, Delisi, I feel like a D-list celebrity right now. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. now I feel like I helped you become a D-list celebrity. And that was the first sign it would happen after that repeatedly at different seminars. And that's when I started to realize it was working. But the other part of it was we would have other organizations ask Michael to speak because someone within that organization listened to the podcast. So I very quickly started to see requests from different bar associations in different cities in different states reaching out to us, asking him to speak about a topic we spoke about on the podcast. And that was great because in my mind, I'm not out there trying to pitch him to talk about a certain topic to an organization because someone else is already doing it because they listen to the podcast. So for anyone who's thinking about doing this, I use that as a great example of expanding your reach because your fans are doing it for you then at that point. And that was beautiful to see even now we had someone in uh indiana and then someone else in illinois and north carolina in the past couple of months reach out to us to have michael speak at something and i just think to myself man i know no one in those states and the only reason we're getting those requests to have Michael speak at those seminars is because someone on that board making decisions about who's going to speak at this seminar listens to the podcast and knows we need to ask Michael Cowan to go talk about that. And it was the beginning of something wonderful. And oh, by the way, when he speaks at those conferences, he's going to meet people who could become referral sources. And wouldn't you know that part of your marketing has been focused on expanding the firm's network of referral sources to be able to bring in more of the exact kinds mm -hmm. of cases that the firm wants to bring in. And what's really cool, I think, about podcasts, but really content in general, but especially podcasts, is that... There's the networking side. So you build relationships with the people who you have on the podcast who you might not have been friendly with or, or known well before. But the host or the co-hosts become knowledgeable about all of the things that were discussed on the podcast, even if they were not the one whose expertise was featured in a particular episode. So for example, I would have to think that Michael could be looked upon as a leader in, in trial practice, in, in witness prep, in witness examination, even if he has had throughout the years, quote unquote, experts who talked about that, but he is the embodiment of all that knowledge. And obviously, they're not, people won't say, okay, well, you know, Michael is now the new David Ball because he had David Ball on a couple episodes. But still, the fact that he is viewed as the person who's absorbed this information and is knowledgeable about it because he was the one interacting and, and discussing the, the topics with the guests, I think is it's mind blowing how you can take that information, take that knowledge that your guests have, and then you are known for it. You're not claiming to be known for it, but bar association members or referral sources look at you, they listen to the podcast and they go, well, that Michael, he must know what he's talking about. He's having these conversations about a general topic about being a trial lawyer and what that means for business, what that means for handling clients, actually going into court and dealing with juries. So it's amazing how much 
that thought leadership component really comes into play. Have you seen cases come in the door because of this? Yes, absolutely. Full disclaimer, it didn't happen overnight. Like I mentioned, we didn't start telling people they could refer cases to us until we felt like we had created relationships with our fans and we thought it was okay to do that. So what we did is I am the voice of Trial Lawyer Nation. So I create all the commercials. I went to the studio, I recorded some audio telling people if you have a case involving death or catastrophic injury, call us and I would tell them how they can get in touch with me or with Michael to talk about a case. And that was it, just that one commercial. It was my soft ask in the middle of the audio and that's the way we went about it. And it did work, it didn't work right away. I think, again, with podcasts, people consume them at different times. So it, it needed to have a little bit of time before people started to hear it. And it did work. We did get people calling about different kinds of cases. I will tell you, last year, we had two big cases that are seven to eight figure cases that came in strictly because of the podcast. That wow. will pay a bunch of people in the office, my <laughs> marketing budget years and years to come and is worth it. But it did not happen overnight. And we do get calls about cases that we won't accept, but I appreciate the phone call and knowing that someone reached out and thought about us because they were listening to the podcast. And one day that person will call with a case that we accept. Just the fact already that you've gotten a couple of cases this year or this past year that have come in the door, I think people have to remember that we're not talking about quantity here. We want quality. And the fact, like, it doesn't matter if you've got 25 inquiries. If none of those inquiries were the kinds of cases you wanted, then yeah, it's leading to inquiries, but they're not the right ones. The fact that you were able to accept two cases and not just two small cases, two sizable cases that to your point probably pays for the production of the podcast and maybe the salaries of the people who are producing it for years to come. That's a really, really big deal. In addition to positioning the firm, positioning Michael, the other attorneys from the firm who are on the podcast, positioning them as thought leaders for more cases to come down down the road. And again, the speaking engagements and the invitations to write for publication or whatever, all of the benefits from this little podcast where Michael's talking for 45 minutes or an hour to people in the trial lawyer orbit. I mean, it's amazing. And congratulations to you and Michael, but really to you for all of the hard work here because you've taken this idea that happened on, on a sweaty run that was in Michael's mind and you gave it life and it's taken on a life of its own, right? It, it, it is a phenomenon because you put in the time and the effort and Michael was available to be there to interview and to be a willing participant. But it's really amazing to show you what a, a marketing tactic, what a marketing strategy can yield when there's really thought put behind it and it's done in a strategic way, not just quick and dirty to get it done. Absolutely. I think you definitely have to have a marketing plan when you do something like this. I mentioned before, if you're going to do something, how can you find a variety of different ways to use that content? And one more thing I would like to add about podcasts, you have guests on your podcast who are now a thought leader on whatever topic you are discussing on your podcast. It would behoove you to ask that guest to help market the podcast as well. And it's not difficult to ask because what person doesn't want to market a podcast that they've been on? And I can tell you the guests we have on the show, if I send them everything they need to help share the podcast that they were on, they will do it. Rarely do I have someone who does not do it. And if you're thinking about the ways to maximize your marketing efforts on a podcast, you should reach out to your guests, tell them to share the episode. And right then and there, you have now expanded the network you have of people listening to your podcast. And you have added the network of your guest to your podcast as well. And doing that over and over and over again just continues to build your brand. Eventually, you're going to have someone from your guest audience now listening to your podcast because they saw your podcast through that guest that you have. And that's how you help create this circle of new people listening to your podcast and new people hearing about you and, and make the most of your podcast. Great point. Even, even people who are 
friends of the host who are in, in close contact with the host on a regular basis outside the podcast interviews, you can't really rely on them to take the initiative and be the ones to create audiograms or be the one to even think about their social media posts outside of, hi, I appeared on Trial Lore Nation last week, right? Like by, by you creating the assets and the message, you control it and you allow them to really copy and paste or, you know, upload and click submit and make their lives easier. But really it's helping the overall firm and the overall podcast because you are expanding your network as you so expertly just described. You mentioned that was a great takeaway, but I, I want to ask you, in addition to that takeaway, what piece of advice would you give to lawyers or in-house marketers across the industry, regardless of their practice or the size of their firm? What tip would you give about launching a podcast? The tip I would give is just do it. Just do it. You have nothing to lose. You get to create the content. You get to define what it is that you're doing and do it on your terms. And the way that I look at our podcast now is Michael can go and talk at all these different CLEs. And let's say there's 50 or 75 people in the room. My podcasts on average have 3,500 people or more listen to each show. I can't get Michael in front of 3,500 people in one year, even if I worked him to death. Eventually, what you're doing in a podcast will pay off if you're doing it right, and it will help create content you can use in a variety of different ways. And the wonderful thing about audio is it doesn't age. So you can use this content over and over and over again. It's not like photos you put on your website where you have to do a new one every year because someone looks different. This is just audio. Um, and I, I really don't think there's anything to lose from doing it. It does not cost a lot of money to buy the equipment. You likely already have it. If you're scared of it, so what? Drop your fears. Do it. You lose nothing by trying something new and seeing if you can succeed from it. And if you don't, at, at least you've got new content that you can still use. It's not for nothing, but I encourage everyone to do it. Podcasts are the future. People are, are learning more and more of the importance of podcasts. Look at Facebook or Meta, for example. They just started to allow podcast pages to share their podcasts on their page. For, for them to do that just shows you podcasts are not going anywhere. Great advice. And, and that's really so smart how you explained it. 3,500 people per episode. So twi and even if there's a ton of overlap, it doesn't matter. 3,500 people each episode, so twice a month, are listening to Michael and absorbing his message, getting to know him and and getting an affinity for him. It might not pay out today, tomorrow, or next week, but you're building a relationship with your listeners, just like you do if you have videos, just like you have if you have a blog, you're building a relationship with an audience that will hopefully create a nice return on your investment down the road. But even if it doesn't, it's positioning you as a thought leader to lead to other opportunities to get that ROI, to build that business and, and build the firm. Let's also think about the effort put into it too. Lawyers don't have a whole bunch of time. You sit down, you record it one time. Let's say it took you an hour. And now that effort is reaching tons of people without you having to do it again. So it's working smarter, not harder. And just that one hour is now being duplicated time and time again to numbers that you wouldn't normally be able to hit if you were to go out and speak at all these different engagements. And the reality is lawyers don't want to be away from their families anymore. They realize now that time is valuable and they want to have a work-life balance. Dedicate your time to record a podcast and let it work for you. Oh, I love that idea that your podcast is like Michael speaking at a conference at 11 at night when someone is driving home or six in the morning when they are busy at the gym or maybe on the weekend during an errand. He's always there to present to them at a time and a date that works best for them. Right? That's, that's, a, that's a fantastic way to think about that. Delizia, I really appreciate the time that you spent chatting about the Trial Lawyer Nation podcast and all the work that went into it and, and building what it is today. What is the best way for people to connect with you if they have questions about the podcast or want to connect with you just naturally? I welcome anyone who's on LinkedIn to connect with me on LinkedIn. I love to share on LinkedIn and learn from others. 
So you can connect with me, Delisi Friday, D-E-L-I-S-I, Friday, like your favorite day of the week. Um, and if anyone wants to email me, they can email me at Delisi at CowanLaw.com, D-E-L-I-S-I at C-O-W-E-N-L-A-W.com. Thank you for your time. It's been great chatting with you. Thank you for having me. Well, that's a wrap for this episode of Legally Contented. Thanks so much for tuning in. Check out the episode show notes for more information about our guests and for links to resources that we discussed during the episode. We'd appreciate your feedback and recommendations for future guests. Email us at hello at legallycontented.com. Hello at legallycontented.com. We would appreciate if you told your colleagues about this podcast, if you subscribe to the podcast and urge them to subscribe as well. And while you're at it, maybe you could even rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, thanks so much for tuning in to Legally Contented.